photographers from that golden age of film grew up at nearby Shugborough Hall. Considering his choice of career and his surroundings, it was a match made in heaven. Stately homes make fabulous backdrops for photo shoots. So what better career for the owner of one of these historic houses to choose than photography? And that's exactly what the owner of Shugborough did. We know him as Patrick Litchfield, second cousin to the Queen and jet-setting photographer to the stars. But his real name was Thomas Patrick John Anson, the fifth Earl of Litchfield, and Shugborough Hall was his family home. He inherited it at tender age 21, but crippling death duties and high maintenance costs forced him to hand it over to the National Trust. Patrick's privileged upbringing meant he had to work twice as hard to prove his success was down to his own merits and he soon gained a reputation as a serious, hard-working photographer. I never used it at all to begin with because I felt that if I rang up an art director and said, I want to come and show my pictures to you, and he said, who are you? And I said, Lord Litchfield. He'd say, oh, well, here's just another rich young man with a camera, an amateur or something. It was the early 60s, an exciting time to be a fashionable young man with a camera in his hand. After a short apprenticeship at a commercial studio in London, Patrick struck out on his own, setting up Litchfield Studios in Notting Hill. In 1966, Patrick got his big break, a contract with American Vogue. This saw him taking photographs of beautiful people and luxury goods in exotic locations all around the world. Back in London, though, he wasn't the only photographer in town. Others, like David Bailey and Terence Donovan, were all becoming hot property at the time. One of this set was John Swannell, who remembers those heady days. It was pretty wild. I mean, it was, you know, um, you'd finish work and whoever you were shooting would hang around the studio till 9, 10 o'clock and then you'd go out for dinner. Wouldn't get in till 4 or 5 in the morning and then get up at 7 or 8 o'clock and shoot the next day. The reason it was so interesting was because the people that came in and out of the studio, all the people that you admired in your life, Michael came to Terence Stamp and Mick Jagger would walk through the room, the Beatles turned up, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, and they were magical days. He never played the Lord, you know, he never played the, you know, the, the grandee or anything. He was, he was just one of the boys. Bailey was from the East End. He never let Patrick get off the hook ever. You know, he'd go to an exhibition of his, and I remember there was a hundred most beautiful women in the world. And Patrick had all these pictures on the wall, and they produced a book, and Bailey came in, and there's a few people standing around, and Patrick said, what do you think, Bailey? He said, um, yeah, Patrick, he said, I was thinking of doing something like this myself, you know, doing a doing hundred of the most beautiful women. He said, now looking at your pictures, he said, I still can. You know, and, and everybody started laughing, and Patrick laughed the loudest. He had a good time, Patrick. I mean, he liked a good time. You know, he had drank the best wines and went out with beautiful women and, and flew him all over the world for 10 years with these girls, and, and it probably doesn't get much better than that. Ironically, Patrick was becoming a celebrity himself. With his jet-set lifestyle and string of beautiful girlfriends, the paparazzi were never far away. To escape the attention, Patrick began to spend more time at Shugborough. The agreement with the National Trust let him have a suite of private rooms. And Shugborough's photographic potential hadn't escaped his attention either. He began to hold shooting weekends here, where he could combine business with pleasure. Shooting at home allowed him to capture intimate pictures of some of the stars of the day. but equally take beautiful formal shots against the lavish backdrops inside. I was very envious, you know, having a backdrop was perfect, couldn't have been better. Wherever he went, you know, he just wandered around and, and there was a backdrop for the pictures, you know, it was just made to measure. 
Alongside his commercial photography, Patrick was also gaining a reputation within his extended family through a series of informal photographs of the royals. This led to the biggest coup of his career when he was appointed the official photographer to the royal wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. His images went around the world. I think the pictures were wonderful. I think they were great. And especially the pictures where it's a bit less formal, whereas any other photographer, would, you couldn't take a, you know, be that forward and, and grab a picture of the Queen doing something over here or the kids running around or Princess Diana talking to her maids, whereas Patrick could because they look over the shoulder and, oh, it's only Patrick, because he's one of them, you know, he's, he belongs to the firm, you know, they know him and feel comfortable with him, you know, he's been their barbecues in Balmoral and so he's one of the family. In the coming decades, Patrick embraced the possibilities of the digital revolution in photography and continued working right up until he died suddenly of a stroke in November 2005. We couldn't believe it, you know, when somebody dies too quickly, because he was in, he was really healthy. Patrick Litchfield's photographic legacy is his unique record of a golden age of glamour.